The Hyperloop was supposed to be the future of transportation. It promised a sci-fi world where people would be shooting along at ultra-high speeds through vacuum-sealed tunnels. A world where you could make the journey between Los Angeles and San Francisco in just an hour. And a world where supposedly archaic forms of transportation like trains would no longer be necessary. Billionaire businessman Richard Branson even described the technology as groundbreaking, and said that it would change transportation as we know it. But it hasn't quite panned out that way. Just a couple of days ago, the biggest and what many saw as the most promising Hyperloop company, called Hyperloop One, announced that it would be closing its doors for good. So what happened to this business that attracted over half a billion dollars of investment? Well, in this video, I want to look at just that, as well as why the company has failed so spectacularly. I also want to ask what this means for the state of transportation technology, and what we could, and even should, be building instead. But first, what actually is a Hyperloop? Well, the idea behind it is to build a long tube with most of the air in it removed to create a vacuum. Then inside the tube, a carriage of people will be levitated and propelled using electromagnets. Now you might say that putting a carriage in a tunnel has been done before, but the concept of a Hyperloop did come with some, at least theoretical, benefits. By levitating the carriage and removing all the air from the tube, there would be no friction to slow the carriage down as it travels, so it would be theoretically able to reach very high speeds. When the concept for Hyperloop trains was first unveiled, speeds close to the speed of sound were promised. But the concept of floating trains in no or low pressure tunnels isn't exactly new. The idea for vac trains, as they were called, is actually over a hundred years old. In 1904, American engineer Robert Goddard first suggested the idea of putting trains in vacuums, and, along with his wife, even secured a patent for the concept. He envisioned a vac train being built between New York and Boston that could travel at 1,000 miles per hour, and would be able to make this journey in just 12 minutes. Now, obviously that project never happened, but that has not stopped this story of wild proposals for vacuum-sealed railways traveling at unbelievable speeds that never seem to materialize from repeating itself, over and over again. Over the decades, similar proposals kept popping up, to much media fanfare, before, as always, fizzling out, only for the cycle to repeat itself a few years later. There was even a proposal to build one under the Atlantic Ocean, connecting New York to London in just an hour. I'll let you guess what happened to that one. But that brings us to today, and the most recent attempt to build the fabled vac train, the Hyperloop. The Hyperloop was first proposed by Elon Musk in 2013, when he revealed his so-called alpha paper that detailed plans for what he called a fifth mode of transport, that he promised would be both cheaper and faster than the existing modes, like rail or air travel. And the media ate it up, spreading the hype for the so-called future of transportation. When he revealed his plans, Musk also effectively open-sourced them, encouraging others to jump on them and take the ideas forward. And given all the hype, there were a lot of people eager to hop on board the supposed gravy train. In the following months and years, various Hyperloop companies were started, but perhaps the biggest and most notable was Hyperloop One. Hyperloop One was founded by an Iranian-American investor named Shervin Pishavar, hope I'm pronouncing that right, in 2014, and immediately started attracting a lot of investor attention. It had raised $9 million by January 2015, and by the end of that year that figure had grown close to $40 million. In May of the next year, they added another $80 million on top of that in Series B funding, before receiving a $50 million investment from Dubai-based investment firm DP World a few months later. That same year, they also ran their first prototype with an open-air acceleration test. This test basically just involved using magnets to accelerate a metal cart to 213 km an hour. The acceleration took just two seconds, which, while impressive, wouldn't be particularly practical for human use because of the amount of g-force generated. It also didn't take place in a depressurized tube, and 213 km an hour is about the same speed that Japan's Shinkansen was reaching all the way back in the 1960s. This prototype was effectively just a large open-air railgun, but that didn't stop investors fawning over the project. In 2017, Richard Branson's Virgin Group jumped on the bandwagon, acquiring a significant stake in the business and rebranding it to Virgin Hyperloop One. At the time, the company was also working on its first proper Hyperloop prototype, 
a 500 meter long track called Devloop being built in the Nevada desert. Unlike the basically railgun prototype I mentioned before, this would actually work more like a real Hyperloop, being constructed of metal tubes that could be depressurized to run magnetically levitated and accelerated passenger pods. Initial tests on Devloop were done without passengers, but in late 2020 the company achieved the significant milestone of its first human trial. The company's CTO and Director of Passenger Experience both rode in one of the pods as it accelerated to 160 km an hour down the 500 meter test track, so about the same speed that was achieved by Britain's East Coast Mainline Railway in 1934. This test pod could also only hold two people, although the company did plan to expand to larger pods eventually being able to hold up to 23 people each. But despite all the excitement around the successful test, things weren't going all that well at Virgin Hyperloop. In early 2022, the company laid off half its staff and announced that they would be pivoting to freight rather than passenger transport, although one has to wonder what benefits transporting freight at that speed would bring. Later that same year, Virgin Group asked the company to drop the Virgin branding from its name, as Branson's company began preparing to sell off their stake in the business. Renamed as just Hyperloop One again, the company limped on for another year. But ultimately, just a few days before the end of 2023, and just over a decade after the initial Hyperloop Alpha paper, they announced that they would be closing their doors and laying off the remainder of their employees bringing Hyperloop 1's story to an end. Now, this isn't necessarily the end for the Hyperloop technology in general, as there are still other Hyperloop businesses out there, like Hyperloop TT. But given the biggest and seemingly most promising Hyperloop firm has now folded, it definitely calls the technology's viability into question. But to many, this failure hasn't come as a surprise. Some were skeptical of the Hyperloop concept from the very start, questioning if it can truly compete with the already established modes of transport like road, rail and air. The first reason for this was safety. According to the British scientist Phil Mason, the combination of the vacuum and the high travel speeds means that the potential damage caused by an accident of the Hyperloop could be astronomical, with anyone inside a crashing pod basically dying instantly or the rest of the people travelling on the line would face the dangers of rapid depressurization. The vacuum tubes themselves also face risk of failure resulting from earthquakes, sabotage and other natural disasters, not to mention the difficulties of evacuating people from the pods. In fact, these safety issues were one of the reasons Hyperloop 1 cited when they switched their focus from passenger services to freight. Secondly, there's the cost. When Elon Musk first presented his Hyperloop Alpha paper, he claimed one of the benefits of the technology would be that it is far cheaper to build than conventional rail. His paper suggested that a route between Los Angeles and San Francisco could be built for as little as $6 billion. But even then, economists were calling these claims into question. Michael Anderson, an associate professor from the University of California, Berkeley, argued that the cost to build a Hyperloop could be 20 times greater than Musk's initial estimates, and that the cost for the LA to San Fran route would be more realistically around the $100 billion mark, which is coincidentally about the same as the existing California high-speed rail project. And speaking of high-speed rail, that brings me to the third big issue faced by Hyperloop technology its usefulness. Despite requiring the same cost to build as the California high-speed rail project, the LA to San Fran Hyperloop could only carry a fraction of the passengers. The California high-speed rail project is estimated to be able to carry up to 115,000 passengers per day. In contrast, a Hyperloop line with pods only capable of holding around 20 to 30 people each can carry just 15 to 16,000 people daily, making it far less efficient. High-speed rail also benefits from being able to integrate and share infrastructure with existing rail networks, while air travel doesn't require much in the way of new infrastructure at all outside of the airports. But to build a Hyperloop, you'd need to build the whole system from scratch. So it's not hard to see why Hyperloop 1 was doomed from the start. But at least it's also much needed research and investment into new transport technologies, right? Well, yes and no. While there can be no innovation without trying new things, and sometimes those new things will fail, there is a word for technologies like the Hyperloop. Gadget barns. Supposedly innovative new technologies that in practice just aren't as good as your classic buses, trams and trains. Particularly when it comes to transport, supposedly utopian new technologies like Hyperloop 
have a habit of distracting public interest, governments and funding away from tried and tested technologies that could make a difference right now, rather than decades into the future if at all. There was a classic example of this in 2019, when an Indian state government announced plans to build a hyperloop between the cities of Mumbai and Pune. Virgin Hyperloop 1 was the main contender to land the contract, but now, given Virgin Hyperloop 1 doesn't exist anymore, this project is likely to never happen. Just imagine if the energy put into that project had been put into the tried and tested technology of high-speed rail instead. Ultimately, it looks like we're not going to be riding around in hyperloops anytime soon. And while I think there is a place for research into new transport technologies, the next time somebody announces plans to revolutionize the way we travel, let's treat it with a healthy degree of skepticism. And until it's absolutely proven, let's focus our time, energy and money on technologies that have proven themselves time and time again. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, consider giving us a like and subscribing to the channel. I'd also like to know what you all think of Hyperloops. Are their technologies still worth pursuing? And of course, I'm Silly Moose. Thanks for watching.